We're here today to feature a badass car. Uh, Robbie Dewani from CSF is here, and we're here to talk about his badass Evo 10. I really look forward to digging into this thing. What do you say, Robbie? Yeah, Mike, uh, it's nice to be here in Moto IQ, you know, home of where this car was built. So, you know, there's been a lot of promotion and publicity on the car, and it's nice to kind of be here to talk about how much work that Moto IQ was involved with it. You guys were definitely instrumental in the entire build process, making sure this thing is going to run correctly. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to dive I've been with you guys and certainly you guys put the whole car together. And, and I think like a lot of the other media outlets kind of like glossed over the car and kind of actually really didn't show how cool this car is, right? Well, I think with you guys being one of the premier automotive websites involved with technical aspects of the car, this is really where you guys should sign and be able to talk about all the details and all the motorsports applications of it all. So let's go and look at all the cool stuff. So Ravi, um, we did a lot of work on the engine for you, and I'm actually pretty proud of this engine. Uh, you want to talk about some of the details? Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a sight to behold. Uh, definitely a lot of fabrication went into this engine bay, uh, but you know, the premise of it all is function to be a motorsports race car. Uh, you know, let's start with the stuff that kind of blings out the most would be all the titanium um, from the exhaust that Sheepy built, fabricated. Um, you know, tying that in with the Garrett Turbo. It's one of their new Gen 2 reverse rotation turbos. Uh, dual turbo smart wastegates. Uh, you know, we got a Magnus Motorsports fuel rail as well as the intake manifold with this uh, nice throttle body that actually comes off a Porsche GT3. So, you know, just some of the highlights of the engine that you see when you first look at it. I think some of the cool things, like I really like Sheepy's manifold, like it's equal length of the merge collector. It's gonna spool that turbo really fast. And uh, this is a Garrett GT3582 uh, ball bearing center section with the, with the Gen 2 arrow. Super efficient turbo, it, it ought to really, really uh, spool up quick. I, I think we have like a 0.82A over our uh, mm -hmm. uh, turbine housing. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna spool like, like pretty good, even though it, it is a fairly moderately sized turbo. I mean, it's a lightweight car, Mike, and uh, you know, it's a race car. We're building it to be an all-purpose race car, so I definitely think for the power levels that we're trying to um, achieve, the turbo is a great, a great match. And I know when uh, I was specking out this motor, what I was trying to do is get you a motor with a broad power band, good response. Um, you know, we don't have a super close ratio gearbox. And, uh, you know, I didn't want a peak power level that was beyond what the block structural integrity could easily handle. So, yeah, I mean, sure, we could have gone for a thousand horsepower, but you would, you know, like kind of have a bomb on your hands. Yeah, definitely. So we're aiming for like maybe, you know, in the low 700s with a good power band and good drivability. Um, what else about the engine? Well, you know, Mike, Moto IQ built the engine. Maybe you could give some more specs on exactly what you guys did on the internal side. Oh, so now it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, some of the things we start with is we used a uh, Manly Chromoly crank, and it's 4340. It's kind of like Chromoly, but it has more nickel and chromium oh, in wow. it, so it's a, it's a tougher alloy, and it's especially suited for crankshafts because it has a lot of good impact strength. Uh, the crank is machined from billet, um, it's nitrided after that, and uh, we WPC treated it, um, the crank after that even, so you get really low friction and really good fatigue strength. Um, we used Carrillo rods with the custom age bolts, uh, you know, with 260 PSI strength, so you have a better than a normal Carrillo rod. Carrillo rods are badass, and these are the top of the line Carrillos. Very cool. Uh, JE made us some custom pistons. Uh, normally turbo motors have like kind of a lower compression ratio, but we went to uh, 10 to 1 because uh, running E85 to take advantage of the fuel. And this is going to give you more torque and a wider power band. Um, the cylinder head, the uh, CNC ported with the uh, Ferrero oversized valves, and we have Kelford cams and the Kelford springs and stuff. So the engine. Um, you know, it's not exotic. We didn't want to sleeve it because uh, I really feel that sleeving sometimes affects the structural integrity of the block. Uh, so, you know, we're maybe down 100 cc's from what we could be if we went really crazy, but I'd rather keep the structural integrity of the block and maybe just turn the boost up a few more pounds if we had to. 
I agree. I think you guys did a great job, Mike. Uh, you know, Evo 10s are generally known to have a lot of uh, Achilles heels, one of them being the motor, um, some stuff with the transfer case and other problems that usually kind of go bust on the track. So, you know, hopefully we can keep this thing uh, on the track as long as possible. Reliability is key. We want to be able to show off the CSF cooling systems that we've put into the car. So the car's got to stay on the track with no problems and be able to go out, you know, at least once a month to the tracks, especially in the hot summer conditions and make sure the car performs the way it should be. Yeah, for reliability, I mean, we went with all ARP fasteners in there, studded everything from the mains to the head, um, running a Cosworth head gasket uh, with the folded stopper layer. Um, we WPC treated everything uh, from the cylinder walls to um, the cams, uh, get the friction down and reduce wear as much as possible. I mean, I th I'm pretty proud of this engine. It should do pretty good. You know, and I'm, I'm glad we're here talking about the engine because a lot of the other media coverage that we've done, no one's really highlighted what's inside the engine. You know, they look at all the components that are outside and bolted on, but no one's talked about the motor build. And I don't think anyone really knows it as well as you guys do, considering you guys put the engine together. Yeah, and you know, like maybe some of the uh, other people might go, well, it doesn't make a thousand horsepower. Wow, whoop de doo But they don't understand that this thing is, you know, built to run all day mm -hmm. and, and to have a really nice broad power band and not be a dyno queen. Definitely. And, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, going into some of the other parts of the engine, obviously it's got the Rywire Signature uh, XRP HS79 hose. He's the one who did all the electrical and fuel in the vehicle, and uh, he definitely did a clean job. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this hose is um, uh, like kind of like a next generation hose. It has a like, Kevlar outer braid and a Teflon liner. Uh, you know, so it's not braided steel, but you know, it uses uh, Kevlar, which is really strong. And um, Teflon is really good because it's really non reactive and it's really good at high temperature. Um, you know, the hose is a lot lighter, and uh, you know, like a braided, braided hose can abrade and saw through things, it's not as likely to do that. Um, I also noticed that you have dual uh, Turbo Smart wastegates here. Um, you know, like one for each side, so you're not going to have boost creep. Uh, that's a cool touch. Um, the sheepy exhaust is really cool. Um, you know, this was kind of done more for show, and maybe it might not pass tech, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first stage of the car was always to be something that had a, you know, a visual impact. And yeah, it definitely looks badass. It blows flames out of the hood. Uh, we'll see what people at the racetrack think in terms of teching the car, but, you know, we'll give it our best shot and see how it goes. And if we have to change things down the line, that's just something we're prepared to do. Um, for the rest of the drivetrain, uh, you're running a tilt and triple disc clutch, right? Yeah, and you guys actually just sent it out to get refreshed, so hopefully you'll be able to hold the power that we're putting out, or you know, around that 680, 720 range, and uh, you know, be good on the racetrack now. And uh, the the really weak point for these Evo 10s is the uh, transfer case. So uh, we had Chip Trans do his top of the line transfer case mods on this, and hopefully it holds up. Yeah, that's uh, that's been one of the the problems that we've been all battling through, you know, since we got the car was making sure that uh, the LSD and the transfer case and everything was. Uh, beefed up so we're uh, we're excited to see how it performs on the racetrack yeah i mean like our own project evo 10 our street car that transfer case blew up with only 400 wheel horsepower wow. driving on the street so chef trans has a really good rep so um you know, like I'm really eager to see how that's going to work. Definitely. And, uh, you know, I see a, a new power steering pump in the corner. I think that came off a Toyota MR2. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm, uh, I'm excited to drive this car with power steering. It's kind of been a pain to uh, move this thing around without it. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons is uh, this car has a really trick front drive with um, a dry sump and everything. And uh, there just isn't pulley sets for power steering with the dry sump. So we had to go to an electric power steering. The MR2 thing works great. It has its own built-in pressure sensors, and uh, you just plumb it in and it goes, and it's all pretty much self-contained. And it's lightweight, and you don't have to have more belts and pulleys and pumps on the front of the engine, so that could stay nice and clean. Uh, I think that's a really good solution, right? Yeah, no, it looks really nice. I mean, you can barely tell if it's there, and you guys didn't tell me it was. So uh, we're excited to have that in the car. 
And then I guess the last thing that we haven't touched out, which obviously is most important to me, would be the cooling system. So, uh, you know, you can see the uh, vertical flow intercooler that we did. Uh, that's a CSF bar and plate core that was welded up by Sheepy Built along with the uh, tucked rye wire radiator that we make for them as well behind it. This is a uh, rye wire's bigger radiator, right? Yeah, it's uh, 24 inches wide by 13 inches tall. He's got a smaller version that's nine inches tall. Uh, we opted to go for the larger one considering that this is gonna be a race car. Uh, is it uh, dual pass and all that, like it your is, other stuff? It is dual pass, uh, so it's nice for the plumbing's sake, you have the inlet and outlet on both sides, but also to keep the water in the radiator twice as long to hopefully get a better outlet temperature. And this radiator, you uses your beefin technology, right? Yeah, our B-tube technology is in it. It's a two row core, so it's a 52 millimeter thick core, so about two and a half inches, uh, both B-tube, and it's got an eight millimeter fin height, so it's got good airflow going through the system as well. Uh, you wanna to explain to our viewers what a, a B-tube is? Yeah, so a B-tube is a, uh, instead of having an oval welded tube, like a normal radiator tube, it's a folded tube that's seam brazed on top, and it's got a seam down the middle. What that does, it is better for structure integrity, mm -hmm. uh, better for surface area contact, mm -hmm. and you can use lighter, thinner aluminum, so it's lightweight and better heat, efficient, uh, heat efficiency. So it's stronger, lighter, better efficiency through the tube. And that's a CSF innovation, right? Because uh, we've never seen anything like that on any other radiator. It is an exclusive technology to CSF, that is correct. And it's one of the reasons why uh, in our testing, CSFs usually come out really, really well. And when we've done head-to-head -head comparisons, they've come out on top every time. And I, you know, that, that I, I appreciate that, Mike, and that's kind of, uh, we're really excited to get this uh, car on the track using this radiator. So we can want to show people that you don't need this super thick, large radiator to be able to cool a 700 horsepower race car. So I think using this radiator that's clean and tucked in an engine bay, but can still perform on the racetrack is going to be a good testament to the technology to be put in our cooling systems. And I remember, um, you know, to get the, all the electronic systems with the drivetrain was a big pain in the ass. So um, we had to run an Evo 9 diff with a mechanical uh, OS Geiken rear diff because the comp complexities of having the AYC and everything working was like pretty, pretty hard, right? I mean, to be honest with you, I didn't even know what an AYC system was until I got the car and we realized that we didn't have it installed. So uh, it definitely has been a little bit of a learning curve for not just uh, myself as the owner of the car, but for Ryan at Rywire and the guys at Moto IQ, because a lot of us just really haven't worked on a lot of Evo 10s. And I think the OS Geikens actually go to work better than the AYC will, especially in the race car. Yeah, I think it definitely is going to be something that's gonna be a step up. It was actually super hard to get I believe it was the last one in the United States, so uh, I'm glad I was able to get my hands on it, and I'm glad it's in this car. Um, I guess some of the other cool things is the um, camera plates for your GHRZ coilovers. They're adjustable for uh, camera and caster. That's a pretty good feature. I guess when we go to the interior, uh, you have your um, Cyvex ECU, and they also make your PDM, right? Well, actually, it's a Cyvex ECU, and the PDM is made uh, by a company called HP Electronic out of oh, Europe. Okay. So uh, next to the passenger wheel well, you have the Cyvex ECU, and you have the brain that runs the HP Electronic keypad. Uh, that keypad is pretty much the only buttons you have in the entire vehicle. So inside the vehicle, you know, that center section is going to be how you start the car, turn the ignition on, um, pumps, lights, blinkers, it's all right there. And the PDM really cleans up the wiring because you get rid of that big mess of relays, switches, and that whole bird's nest. It just turns it into one little clean unit. Yeah, Ryan at Rywire did a very good job, uh, you know, plumbing the car, doing the electrical, making it look clean, but also being efficient. So, you know, you cut down on some of the weight of having a bunch of wires all over the place as well. And it's all um, like mil spec and built with all the Raychem stuff. Yep, and that's correct. Uh, I mean, like one of the things we always say is that most 80% of race car failures are plumbing and wire problems. I mean, engine blows up, usually you find the root cause is plumbing or wiring. Um, so you did everything right from the basics. Um, you have an AIM dash here? Yep, that's an AIM uh, full color display dash. And uh, yeah, it's just you know, another really high end component that we wanted to include. Again, Ryan from Rywire was able to uh, wire that all up and source all the components for us. And this car started out as a world challenge race car, right? So it has the full, really inclusive cage that ties the whole unibody together. 
that was one of the reasons we actually bought the car. You know, it was a Crash Pro World Challenge car, and to be able to start with a roller that had the cage already saved us a bunch of time and a bunch of money. Yeah, and it's a pretty pretty nice cage. I mean, I can't think of how to do it better myself. No, I, when I was when I saw the cage, and you know, especially around the doors, it was just one of those things where I was like, wow. I mean, we're starting we're starting with you know fifteen thousand dollar cage plus plus you know saving ourselves about three or four months time and getting it done. Yeah. Um, that's really nice tin work you got back there too. Yeah, all the uh, all the panels were done by uh, Gabe down at ASC Speed Metal. Uh, he did all the uh, aluminum sheet metal fabrication on the interior, the trunk. So all the paneling's done by him. Uh, you know, we just went the next step over and got it all powder coated by MB Performance in this nice, you know, crinkle black. Yeah, that's a pretty nice touch. I remember for SEMA, for the show aspect, we had all your dry sump stuff inside the car. And uh, to pass tech, you know, that wasn't gonna fly. So now we're relocating it back here. Um, the vent tank that would have been putting smoke in your interiors back here now. And I'm actually really glad this is back here because we actually did take the car to shift sector back in May with the uh, Peterson can and the vent can inside behind the uh, front seats. It was good. And that was smoky. just blowing everywhere. And I had forgotten to put my visor down. So as I was going 140 miles down the runway, it was just fumes everywhere. So yeah, <laughs> this is a safer alternative. Uh, it's going to be able to pass tech this way. And uh, it's just the way a real race car should have the plumbing. Helps your weight distribution too, right? <laughs> that is correct, so. Yeah, and lots of nice attention to detail with the uh, tin, tin work, and it's very nice back there. I guess we can look under the car, right? Or yeah. is there anything else you want to show off up here? It has a Street Fighter LA wide body. Oh yeah, let's talk about yeah. the wide body kit. Yeah, so the wide body kit is a, uh, it's a wide body kit from Street Fighter LA. Uh, it comes as a bolt-on kit. What we did was mold it to the car just to give it more of a clean look and uh, improves it about 10 millimeters out on each side, so it's gonna have a nice wider stance for the racetrack. And uh, I definitely think it gives it a nice, uh, a nice look to the rather you know, bland stock Evo X body. Oh, that's more like 50 millimeters, right? Yeah, probably a little bit more than 10, I guess, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty wide body. And, and who designed this uh, kit? John Sabal designed it for us. Yeah, and he, that guy's badass. Yeah, he's, he's probably one of the best, if not the best automotive uh, you know, designers out there. Awesome. So uh, let's go take a look under the car. Let's do it. So of course this is a CSF car, right? So you got to tell us about this oil cooler. Yeah. So this is one of our new uh, bar and plate oil coolers. This is our smallest size. It's about 16 inches wide, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the nice compact size allows the oil cooler to kind of be placed anywhere. This is sitting, you know, on the passenger side, right in front of where the fog light would be. Mm -hmm. So we've put this oil cooler, and it's attached uh, to the Magnus Motorsports dry sump kit. So that's kind of what you see with all these, uh, you know, with the Peterson oil distribution area going into some of the pulleys and that kind of runs to the back of the car for the dry sump kit. And this this is one of your trick oil coolers, right? With the billet mounting pads and the super tough uh, barn plate core. Yeah, exactly. We you know we have it right in the front. If a rock hits it, we're not really worried about any type of oil leakage. Um, it's something that's super compact. It's dual pass. You can see how easy it is to route the lines. And uh, yeah, we're excited to have it on the car and show people how well it works as an oil cooler. The dual pass, um, dual pass uh, really helps make it efficient for that small package, right? Yeah, it's efficient. Uh, because the you know the fluid comes in from the top, goes all the way around, circles the rack around to the other side of the core, and comes out at the bottom. And that usually helps 15 to 20 percent uh, better efficiency in the same size package, right? Yep, that's correct, Mike. Um, and I see like the billet mounting pads are really shining here, enabling you to do a real simple mount. Yet you know like. You don't have to worry about the core cracking or fracturing with vibration and all that. No, and you know, you guys here at Moto IQ did a really good job building this uh, aluminum um, shroud to go along with it that kind of just hugs the front bumper. Yeah, so, so all that air goes through the, the core. The air is going right through and it's got good uh, area behind it for good exit flow. Um, and the, some of the flow through the car is helped by the, um, the end plate here with the, the, um, the ribbing, right? Yeah, we've developed this new bar design called, uh, you know, it's an aeroflow design. So we've notched out a section from each bar, but it actually makes it stronger. It's better airflow through the core rather than scattering. When it hits a square bar, it can flow through and it makes the whole oil cooler lighter as well. Yeah, that's a really trick feature that I've never seen in anything. 
yeah, we're excited to have it on the car, and uh, you know, I definitely think it's a good complement to the dry sump kit that we got from Magnus Motorsports. Uh, does your um, do your plates have turbulators in them? Yeah. So inside the uh, the bar and plate design, there is a turbulator that will um, scatter the oil as it goes through. It slows down the flow of oil as well. It gives it more surface area contact. That's all my like, cool stuff. More performance in the smaller, simpler package. That's that's what we're trying to do. Um, so the dry sump, this is something that I think a lot of guys that especially do road race and time attack and drifting ignore. I mean, you see a lot of engine failures and they're usually related to two things, like not enough cooling and not enough oil and not enough oil pressure. And like a lot of cars really starve in the corners. Like anytime you pull more than one G, you're probably starting to suck air. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is uh, people don't c consider is that a wet sump has a lot of air entrapment in the oil and the air never c fully comes out. And when your air percentage is like more than 40%, you might have full oil pressure, but if it's foamy oil, if you're pumping through it a lot of pressure, it still doesn't, lubricate properly so the dry sump you know like it sucks everything out and it, it goes back to the uh, rear tank to be de-aerated de and uh, and goes to the cooler and gets cooled and then it gets pumped back into the engine you're getting cool solid oil and no matter how many g's you're still going to be getting solid oil uh, so i think this is going to really help your engine life yeah, we're, uh, we're excited to have the part on the car. You know, Mag uh, Magnus is a good friend of mine now after we've gone through this build together. And uh, definitely all the stuff he makes is super high quality. You know, he's known for all his GTR builds, the engines, and all the stuff that he does there. And uh, got quite a name in the Evo world as well. So having him on board to help us with the build as far as some of his hardware as well as his tuning, um, it's something that I think is a benefit to everybody involved with this car. I hope we make him proud. <laughs> Um, the suspension is something that has a lot of attention to detail, right? And this is from the World Challenge car, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, these are full chromoly subframes. Uh, they came from Europe. Um, you know, this is super high budget stuff as well, um, tied in with the rally ar arms. Um, we were very happy to be able to get this along with the, uh, the roller and, you know, the crash probably world shell that we got. Uh, because again, you know, these are items that are super expensive, uh, long lead times if you were to buy them or if you wanted to manufacture something to, that was similar to this. So it's nice to have these parts along with it. Uh, I can see that they corrected some of the geometry, so it has less anti-dive than stock. Uh, the roll center looks like it's corrected, and the uh, it looks like it's been bump steered too. So it's, it's helping like a lot of geometry problems you typically see in the stock stock suspension-based car that's been lowered a lot. And uh, you have JRZ. Um, remote reservoir uh, for McPherson struts? Yeah, so again, the uh, the suspension, the JRZ two-way coilover, the whole system again came with the car. So it was nice to have a super high quality suspension that we could use and transfer over to this build. That's that's pretty trick stuff. Now, um, we, we helped you out with these uh, stop deck brakes, right? This is a trophy kit? We actually had the stop tech brakes and you guys were able to source this new rotors. The rotors were pretty oh, okay. beat up. So the brake system came with the car as well. But, you know, right before SEMA, I remember you guys working hard to get us, uh, you know, fresh rotors. Yeah, these are the aero rotors. Uh, they're full floating, uh, wide annulus. Um, the uh, vents in here are the CFD design for maximum flow. And uh, the, the trophy caliper is uh, made out of uh, a 7075 billet, hard anodized, uh, has this bridge so it doesn't flex. I think, you know, when it comes to the Evo 10, this has to be the best brake system that you could buy for the car. So uh, we're excited to have that, you know, good stopping power, especially for the half mile events we're planning on taking the car to. And uh, I remember we had the big headache with the wheel bearings. Like we're trying to figure out how, how the ABS worked on this and there was no tone ring. And uh, we came to find that the uh, tone ring is actually built into the bearing of all things. I'm glad you guys figured it out because I had no clue. Uh, that took <laughs> us a while. Had to call some friends at Mitsubishi to find that out. You would, who would have guessed, right? Definitely. Um, let's see, going to the back here. The problem with the Evo 10 is the AYC and to get it to work correctly with a standalone ECU. So what we did is we got the diff from a Lancer Rally Art 
to the nose, geek and limited slip, and now we're set. This whole tubular rear subframe, um, this gets rid of some of the weird geometry, gets rid of some of the bump steer and some of the uh, uh, excessive anti-squat that the stock stuff had. Um, gee, what's this? Is it a carbon fiber fuel cell? Yeah, enclosure? that's another high budget item, custom made, that came with the roller when we bought it. Uh, you know, that's something that I didn't even know where to start if I wanted to buy one of those or who to go to get one. So it's nice to have that on this car. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff underneath the car was a big reason why we bought it. Right. You know, the subframes, the carbon fiber fuel bladder, the suspension system that came along with it. I mean, you're looking at upwards of $20,000 for just these three components. That was the price of what we bought the entire package for. Right, and I mean, when you consider all the stuff, uh, you know, you're looking at everything. Man, just to fabricate all this stuff would have been, I don't even know how much it would have cost. It's not even just about the cost. You know, we had a timeline to build this car for SEMA last year, so I don't think we would have been able to even make the deadline considering how long it just takes to make a lot of these components. Right. Um, I noticed at the front you have a Hotchkiss like off the shelf bar that's three way adjustable, but your rear anti sway bar is really trick. I mean, this thing has blade adjusters and. Uh, uh, it's a it's a tubular type, um, a total race race setup. You can adjust the end height so uh, when you corner weight the car, it doesn't preload the suspension. And this this is really nice. This is one of the nicest bars I I've seen that wasn't on like a uh, like a prototype or a tube frame type car. Just the cost of this is a few thousand dollars right here. Um, Again, the JRC uh, rear rear shocks, uh, stop tech four piston brakes. Um, oh, of course the uh, the cooler. We can't, we got to talk about your cooler, yeah. right? So this just went in, and we're really excited to have this. We're using this as the rear diff cooler. Uh, this is a perfect place to show off how robust the cooler is. You know, it's gonna be taking a lot of debris under there, rock the chips, rockets and the wheels. you know, whatever it can be thrown at it. And I think it's definitely going to be able to, uh, you know, take everything that's, you know, given to it. Uh, this is our 8066 Boss Cooler. This one has built-in dash tan fittings. So it's gonna be real easy to kind of just route this to uh, get the oil going into the core. It's also a dual pass core, easy for plumbing as you're gonna be able to have the inlet and outlet connections on the same side also. And having the uh, dash dash tin fittings built into the thing, you save probably about thirty or forty bucks in fittings right there. I right? mean, with how much money's gone into this car, any dollar that we can save is a blessing at this point. So. <laughs> And I like how the billet mounting pads enable to, uh, us to get a really clean, simple mount for the cooler that's totally sturdy and solid. Yeah, I think it looks really good down here, and I think the size is perfect for what we're trying to do with it. Um, there's the uh, ACD pump, and that was like a big pain in the ass to get working. I mean, the amount of time, I think I've spent a good six, eight hours not just installing it, getting the wiring to it, but then testing it to make sure it works with the Cybex system. Uh, you know, we had to buy a radium fuel dampener that's cr uh, attached to the front of the car just to make sure it pulses correctly. So that's something that, uh, you know, was definitely a learning experience for everybody involved. You know, we had no idea that that pump even needed to be installed in the car, but that's what you need to be able to get the all wheel drive system working. There was 30 people in front of me in line on back order list with Mitsubishi North America to get this, but my good friend Dominic Lee, who works for Mitsubishi, pulled some strings and was able to get me the first one when it came in. And um, yeah, for those of you who don't know, that's the pump that controls the uh, computer-controlled center diff on this. And when the car was purchased, uh, that was missing, and they might have actually run the car in um, World Challenge at first, like as a front-wheel drive, and they didn't even know. <laughs> I don't know if that was in the car when we got it, but I definitely think someone got to the car before I bought it and took a lot of the higher end stuff. And I think that was one of the components that, you know, they definitely bought before I got there. So I'm glad we actually have one on the car now. And, and no one knows how to hook that thing up. And it took hours of research for us to figure out how to get that thing to work. And it took a long time for uh, Ryan to figure out how to wire it too, right?
right. Yeah, you know, we got Wayne from Cybex involved to help Ryan with the uh, wiring of it. Uh, I know you and Martin did an extensive amount of research on exactly how the cooler worked. Uh, you know, we all dug through a bunch of part numbers, whether it was Japanese Mitsubishi websites or the U.S. catalog, to figure out even what we needed to buy. And I definitely think we actually bought a lot more parts than we needed just because we didn't know what we needed to get in the first place. Well, it's in there now. <laughs> um, shoot. I guess like uh, what's going on now is um, we're kind of making the conversion from a show car into something that you can actually go out and have fun with, right? Yeah, we want to make it an all around competitive vehicle that showcases not just the CSF com cooling components, but all the other partners that are involved with the build. You know, Moto IQ who built the car, show everybody that, wow, this is a very well balanced race car that's competitive, it's fun, and it's reliable. Um, I guess some of the things in the future is, uh, you know, we're building a solid base for cleaning up a lot of the things and making them race worthy. And uh, I guess it depends where you want to take it. Like if we were to go time attack, we're going to have to build a serious downforce aero package. Uh, if you just want to have fun as a track day car, we can run it like this for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, for top end racing, we probably don't need all the aero to make the drag, but uh, probably just enough to keep you from flipping over and dying. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, going into uh, 2019 and getting this car on the racetrack, I think a lot of the haters and the cynicals who didn't think the car was going to be a race car are, uh, are going to be pleasantly surprised to see how well this car performs. I can't wait to get to start running this thing. And well, thank you for bringing, uh, coming by and helping me explain all the cool things on this. No, thanks for having me, Mike. I think you are the best person to really talk about the details of the car, whether it's from the engine to the suspension. Uh, you guys being built the integral partner on this car, you know, the first Moto IQ garage build, having the car here and you guys working on it, I'm really confident that this thing is gonna do really well on the racetrack. If you like this video, um, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here someplace. Um, if you like tech, come on back. If you like to read about it, go to MotoIQ.com and check out all the cool articles we have there. And until next time, see you later. See good into his nostrils. She cleared up in there, brother. I can see the bats in the cave, brother.